Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're so glad to welcome you as part of our community tonight. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and distributed live stream. By entering this virtual meeting room, you give your consent to be recorded and distributed by Vienna Live with Simeon Morrow and other third parties. If you prefer to not be recorded, please go to the LinkedIn Live video feed, the link to which I have just placed in the chat room. Tonight, our featured guest is Professor Pat Bianchi, a jazz organist, professor at the Berkeley College of Music and host of the Sirius XM show, Organized. Pat's latest album, Three, will be the subject of tonight's conversation. Thank you so much for inviting me today, Simi. I appreciate it. Thank you, Pat. So welcome. Tell us a little bit about um, how, where you come from, how your musical tastes were formed, and why you decided to become a jazz organist. Okay, well, I'm originally from Rochester, New York. Um, I come from a long line of musicians. My father was a drummer. My grandfather on my father's side was a saxophonist and also played piano. My grandfather on my mother's side was a trumpet player as well as my uncle who was a trumpet player and educator and my cousin professional opera singer and my brother is a classical guitarist so music ran in the family and at the time i was coming up the thing that was really popular music wise was uh, everybody in my family they had played and was called dance bands and basically it was a small group configuration playing the music of the big band era you know they'd be playing glenn miller um, you know, different things uh, along that of that popular music of that time, but in a small group, usually a trio, usually a quartet. And my father was big into recording the band, so he would record it and bring home the tapes and I would be sit there the next morning with him listening to the recordings, which as four or five years old, I found fascinating. And I always was uh, intrigued by the quote unquote keyboard sounds because it was a, what I thought was a keyboard player that sounded like an organ, but it turns out it was, and it was an instrument called the Cordovox, which is an accordion with electronic organ sounds built into it. And that was also very popular back in the 60s, 70s, and the early 80s. So just the sound of the instrument, I was fascinated. And that led me to, you know, showing an interest in playing keyboard instruments. And for my sixth or fifth birthday, I forget exactly, I was given a Farfisa organ, which is like a transistor organ built in the 60s. To, you know, and I took that and I had it in the basement and all these recordings my father had made of his band, I'd sit there and learn all these songs by ear and just figure out old, old standards, you know, and learn how to play bass because there was no you know, key, key, the keyboard was just playing right hand and bass lines, since that's what you did on an accordion. And I was, so I was learning all the bass lines with my left hand and the melodies and the chords in my right hand. And I did that. And by the time I was seven or eight, I actually played a few solo engagements myself doing that, a couple private events, just doing that. And by the time I was 
12 or 13, I was actually substituting in my father's dance band. And uh, so I was playing, they were at, you know, various uh, Elks clubs or other private functions that we did. And it was a great education because, you know, though it wasn't jazz per se, it was learning a lot of, a lot of great music, um, working with musicians much older than, than myself. And it was really, a, it was a foundation for me to, to kind of get going. And even to the point there was one night we were playing a particular venue in one room. I was playing with my father and the saxophone player. And in the other room, my grandfather was playing. So three generations of us playing in the same venue one night, doing different different events, which was pretty cool. But that eventually kind of wove its way into, uh, you know, especially as I got into in the early high school years, hearing different jazz pianists and getting a little bit of interest in that. But by the time I was 16, I heard two organists, an organist from Buffalo, New York named Bobby Jones and uh, another one named Joey DeFrancesco. And both of those had a huge impact on me. And that's when I knew that I was sort of caught the bug and wanted to pursue this instrument. It took a little bit of time to fully get there, but that's how the whole process started. Wow. Okay, let's have another listen to This Is When Sonny Gets the Blue. <laughs> Pat, uh, tell us about this new album three. When uh, you, you just said that you you come from, you know, the family of musicians that were doing this swing kind of dance band music, then I when I I thought, wow, yeah, listening to this recording, these tunes that you've chosen, it's kind of conservative. There's nothing really experimental out there. Tell tell us about this new album, how you put this all together. Well, for me, this album is kind of going back to roots in certain respects in you know, I wanted to pick music, first of all, that I, I really enjoyed playing a lot, you know, standards, you know, I've done plenty of records where I have written complex arrangements, where I have taken songs, turned them inside out, gone far into left field and all that kind of thing. But I just felt like, you know, wanted to do something a little more center, straight down that, or just to, to Pike, so to speak. And, you know, just be able to play. And the way this section came about is, 
in a way, kind of that. This trio that you hear on the recording, we had played together. I had played with the drummer on many occasions over the years, and the saxophone player, the same thing. But we had only maybe played one or two in informal gigs together as a band. And it had a good energy, a good vibe. So we went into the studio, and I decided, well, you know, let's just kind of see what happens. I wasn't even uh, counting on a record would actually come out of it. It was just sort of a thing where we went in, and maybe we were in the studio for five hours, tops, and laid down a couple takes of everything and just, you know, play. Because I missed that sometimes about in the recording process. Or in, and in general, it's just like just going to play. And so I set up. You know, the tunes I picked, the order I put them in, I tried to think of it as how I would do a, a, a live concert, you know, in, the, in terms of everything in the arc, you know, in terms of the way things, you know, the intensity builds or and or comes back down. And just try to make it something that was fun and all about playing, you know, great music and taking a little bit more time than normal to stretch because on many recordings, your song might be four minutes, five minutes. Uh, you know, but the, I think the shortest song on this particular recording was close to seven minutes and the longest was 12. So that's a lot of my intent. And surprisingly, when it all said and done, it came together really nice. Yeah. And tell us a little bit about the, the musicians, could you? Yeah, of course. Colin Stranahan, uh, who plays drums on the recording, is somebody I knew when I lived in Colorado. I moved to Colorado for uh, after I had graduated college to play out there. And Colin is a few years younger than me, but he came up and, uh, you know, just was an incredible drummer and we had maintained our friendship over the years. He came to New York after I eventually came to New York. We did a little bit of playing here, but he was doing so many other things as well, playing with guitarist Jonathan Kreisberg, pianist Kevin Hayes a multitude of things. And we've had talked during the pandemic about kind of reuniting and playing together again. So we, you know, I, I kind of made that happen with this recording. And Troy Roberts, um, who's an incredible saxophonist. I mean, he's played with Joey DeFrancesco, Jeff Watts, um, you name it. He's one of the top call cats. We've been friends since he moved here in 2011, I believe, from Australia. And we had done some playing off and on the, through the years as well. And so I decided, you know, it would be a perfect combination because we get along great both on the bandstand and off the bandstand. So those were kind of my motives in picking these cats to play. Okay. Let's have another listen to, uh, to the album. This is Dance Cadaverous. <laughs> Pat, tell us a little bit about, uh, you just told us about why you chose the musicians on a personal level. Tell us about this concept of trio, which is a little bit unusual. How do you, um, is that the, the, what is the normal trio with a Hammond B3 organ? Normally you find a Hammond organ with a guitarist in the trio to fill up because when the Hammond is taking a solo, 
and also playing the bass lines with their left hand and left foot, the guitarist will usually fill in the holes with playing chords. And then when it's time for the guitarist to solo, the organist will play the bass lines with their left hand and foot and then play chords with the right hand. So they kind of reverse roles even for the, for the accompaniment aspect of everything. With having a saxophone instead, what it does is it, it creates a different kind of openness for this sound. There was a couple of organists, uh, one of my favorite uh, jazz organists, Don Patterson, who would record often in this format with a tenor saxophone, usually Sonny Stitt. Sometimes um, there was a couple recorded with Gene Ammons, but it was just organ, drums, and, and saxophone. And it just gives, like I say, a different kind of openness to the sound. Similar to like, for example, one of my favorite records was a saxophone, Sonny Rollins, Live at the Village Vanguard with Elvin Jones and Wilbur Ware. And there's no piano. It's just, the, it's just an open sound without accompaniment. So that's, I decided I wanted to do that because it challenges me as, an, as a musician because I don't have anything to lean on in the same way. There's no chords behind me. There's rhythm of the drums, but all the harmony and everything, it, it gives me a greater responsibility, but it also gives me a different, a different kind of freedom because I can explore different things in that respect. Wow. So you saw this really as a, a challenge. I was talking to you and I was saying, oh, this is, you know, it seems like a very conservative taste you have in this album, but really that was you were doing that because you wanted to challenge yourself and see can I can I fill all those roles? Can I can I wear all those hats at the same time? Exactly, especially in tunes. You know, for example, in listening to the song "Dance Cadavers," if you look at the, uh, from a compositional standpoint, the harmonic, the harmony that's going by the chord changes, they're very complex. So to be able to try to navigate those things without the the accompaniment and still have it, have it make sense. You know, those kind of challenges that I liked or in, for example, Love for Sale, you know, that when it comes to that, when you hear the saxophone solo, there's all sorts of things going on and energy building because of what the drummer and I are doing together from an accompaniment standpoint. But that changes when it's me playing. So I have to, to work, not work harder, but do more to create the same kind of energy because it's two. Um, one person supporting a soloist versus two with a saxophone. So it's great. And it's a, it's a night. I like the sound, you know, it's a very open sound, a lot of space. Sometimes space is a beautiful thing too, in the music as it is. So. Okay. Let's listen to one more song. This is crying blue. As we can hear many different, many, many, many different musical styles. And so that brings us to the uh, more philosophical question of the evening. Pat, tell us about the challenges you go through because you dedicate your career to an instrument that many people have never even heard of. Music is a highly prejudicial art form, and our society teaches us to imagine a jazz trio as piano, double bass, and drums. That means that when we discover your work, it's from a negative viewpoint. Your trio is missing two of those three instruments. Another thing our society teaches us is to appreciate, quote unquote, great music. However, great music is inseparable from those same prejudices regarding music instruments. 
what do you respond to audiences who tell you, well, I like the piano more? And what do you respond to those who believe that the instrument defines the musician? What is your message to young Pat Bianchi's out there? Well, that's a, it's a really interesting question with many parts to it. And the first thing that I think I want to address with that is, yes, the Hammond organ uh, to the general population might not be a very well-known instrument, but whether people know it or not, it's probably the most heard instrument. If you want to go back to the soap operas uh, in the 30s, the radio shows, if you want to, you know, big bands, you know, Count Basie, he was playing some organ, he had well, Bill Davis playing organ, obviously Jimmy Smith and all them, you know, of the 50s and the 60s, but also how it was used in country music, rock and roll, of course, gospel church, you know, and, um, it's it's everywhere people might not know it but they've heard it a ton you know and it's still to this day you know in you know soul um it's it's but people just don't realize they're hearing it's a thing so when people come up to me and say you know i've never heard the organ before or i like the piano better the first thing i you know that comes to my mind is everybody is entitled to their opinion you know which is totally cool because if you want to go a step further is for as many people love jazz piano there might be a hundred people that love Oscar Peterson or Bill Evans, but do not like Don Poland or McCoy Tyner. You know, everybody has a personal taste, but I think the thing of it is, is if people take the time to listen more and actually if, if a situation is available, where you can actually see it. I think that helps. I think that's with any kind of music. If you're able to experience it in person, I think it makes a difference in your, um, in your, perception of it, you know, so uh, that's the, the first point. I think, you know, as far as people who know the two instruments, but say they don't like the organ or like the, uh, or prefer the piano, I've actually had discussions with people that say it doesn't belong in jazz, that the Hammond organ should only be for the church and that's it. Again, everybody's entitled their opinion, but I think, um, you know, it, it requires a listener to do some investigating and to see what's happening in terms of what music has been recorded. Some people may not like, for example, of the 60s, that there was a, a, a plethora of soul jazz where it was just primarily, you know, loud blues licks all the time, things like that, that you, they would hear and prefer hearing the sensitivity of Bill Evans. But then if you go and you find another organist, for example, Dr. Lonnie Smith, who can play a ballad at a whisper on this organ and almost make you cry it's you know do you do, do a little bit of investigation and after doing the investigation if you know it's not for you there's nothing wrong with that you know some people don't like jazz flute you know some people don't like the vibraphone but they like they prefer the trumpet some people do uh, insist that guitar does not belong in jazz but there's a lot of incredible guitars so it's always personal taste but i think especially in, the, in, the, in these times where there's so much access to so much music is, you know, an open-mindedness, I think is key, you know, and to, to give it a good listen. And if it resonates with you, that's even better. If not, well, it, as long as you're appreciating music, that's the bottom line in the end. And so, Pat, what do you tell? Uh, there are, of course, you know, uh, social hurdles to get past when you play a certain instrument, as you said, that uh, what do you tell young people who feel... Oh, you know, I, they feel constrained. They feel, well, I should, you know, I should have chosen the flute and not the, the double bass. Right. I think, you know, maybe it's easier said than done, but I'm finding it true to be continued to be true as I get older is you have to stick with what you believe in. Um, uh, if you, if you make you any decision or all your decisions based upon what's currently popular or social trends or things like that, trends always change things, life moves on, things move forward, you know, and if you, and if you only gear what you do musically and or otherwise based on those kind of, uh, you know, circumstances or criteria, sooner or later, you're going to be yesterday's news or you're not going to be anything. But if you stay true to yourself, even if, you know, you're not successful in a way that you envisioned yourself being at the top of the heap or whatever, I think knowing that you stay true to your, what you wanted really means a lot more to you in the end, you know, and to your career. Okay, let's have another listen. This is Stardust. Stardust. 
Last question, Pat. What do you wish yeah. those who, who listen to this album? Well, I mean, first, I hope everybody has a great day, and I wish they could be lots of happiness. I hope you, uh, if you have time to check out this recording, I hope you enjoy it and continue continue to support the arts, no matter what, because we need people to continue supporting the music so we can, as a uh, famous drummer, Art Blakey said, so we can continue to, ap to appear instead of disappear. Okay, let's uh, watch. We have a special uh, a special treat. We get to see the trio. Uh, this is at a live concert. <laughs> So let's see how we can stay in touch with Pat. Thank you. So here is his website, patbianchi.com. Pat, so um, if people want to buy this album, they just go here to disc discography. Is that right? If you go to recordings, mm -hmm. the first the first tab next to home, Got you can it. get it there. Perfect. There it is. So you can buy a CD or you can download it. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. You can listen to it again here. So check that out. That's patbianchi.com slash recordings, and it's all available. And Pat, about upcoming concerts and all that, can we see yep. that here? That'll be under tour. Yeah, under tour. Got it. Perfect. Oh, great. So oh, February 24th coming up in Nyack, mm -hmm. lovely Nyack. Okay, fantastic. So we've got tons of concerts here. Uh, all you have to do is go to patbianchi.com slash tour. And Pat, if people want to reach out to you with their questions, they should um, go to contact here. They can also they can go to contact. Yep. Fantastic. So feel free to reach out to Pat if you've got any questions uh, or any comments you want to make. Also, you can follow him on Instagram, Pat Bianchi Official, and on Facebook, which is, again, Pat Bianchi Official. Thank you so very much to Professor Pat Bianchi. Thank you so much, Simeon, for having me here today. It's a lot of fun to get to talk to you. So let's see what's coming up next week on Vienna Live. So we see there's some new publications already that are out. So you can watch those uh, videos at your leisure.
And if we go here to the second page, then we have Sullivan Fortner solo game. So come welcome jazz pianist Sullivan Fortner to Vienna Live, and he will present us with his daring new album, Solo Game. So that's next uh, Wednesday. And it is Sullivan Fortner. The name of his album is Solo Game. As always, all information about upcoming shows can be found at www.simeonmorrow.com. Once again, thank you so very much to Professor Pat Bianchi. Thank you to Victoria and Frederick Mulligan, as well as Agnieszka and Benoit Rivole for their support of this show. Thanks to my cousin Mike, who's a marketer at Layer App. If you're an architect or an engineer, they've got a really cool tool you should check out. Thanks also to Mary Schlesinger for the lovely Viennese library you can see behind me. Most of all, thanks to you, our participants, who make it all worthwhile. From New London, New Hampshire, and New York City, New York, goodbye, and see you next Wednesday. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here.